My dad had decided after World War II that he would rather ranch than be with a circus, and so he took over the family ranches. I started fishing when I was probably four. When we had the ranches of White Sulphur, there was a Whitetail Creek ran right by the house, and I think it with a willow branch and some monofilament and a schnell hook and, a, and worms. God only knows how many brook trout I killed as a kid. Fly fishing gives you a connection to the land, that open space, running water, rising trout, that fixates in people's minds. You really appreciate being out. You see stuff that you wouldn't normally see, whether you see a common muskrat or you see more exotic, whether you see otters or you, know, you see all the nut hatches or the warblers and stuff along the stream banks. There's some primal deal about catching trout. Reading the water, looking where fish ought to be. The new bro guides would say, you know, the tug is the drug and you know, it's kind of the, it really is a drug. And as the country has moved away from agriculture, I think it's less than 2% of the people are actually out on the land these days, and you've connected more to the environment. It's a fascination that goes with that. And you take somebody that they've got a job in New York City, they live in Connecticut, and they get on a train at 5.30 in the morning, and they're going into the cities, and they're working at some small boutique investment bank. And you're either in a train or you're on the sidewalk, and then you're back on a train and seven days a week and all of a sudden you're out here in the, in the middle of Montana and you're on a fly fishing stream and you spend one, two days, three days, maybe you get, if you're lucky you get to spend a week and then you go back. I think that gets a lot of people through that routine. When you live in Montana and you work for a nonprofit and you need to raise a million and a half or two million dollars a year, you can't do it in state. I mean, there's just not the wealth here to be able to do that. And for the land reliance and private land conservation of Montana, we came up with what well, we, the board refers to it as the trout route, where people from New York and Chicago and Minneapolis or San Francisco or Los Angeles came to Montana to fish. And so we, under the old adage that philanthropy should be fun, we started taking people fishing. They figured out how to raise money with it. You got to spend a full day with somebody that was maybe the head of a Fortune 50 or Fortune 500 company, and the only other people that got to spend all day with them was their family. So you really got a chance to make a connection. It's great to be able to bring somebody out and be able to stand them in an area and you look at the mountains. Here's the Bzorki Beartooth on one side, here are the crazy mountains on the other side, and, you're, and that vast openness. You can have that, or there are places on the Missouri, you know, there's a house over 75 feet. And then you go around the corner and there's a conservation easement and there's no development on the banks. And you could say, well, here's what we're trying to do. And it was an easy sale. I went to work for the Land Reliance. I think the Land Reliance had like 35 conservation easements on less than 100,000 acres. And you fast forward to today when you have 847 first generation easements on a million acres. It was a hell of a run. And we did it in the hard country. Like we're sitting here in Madison County and there's 135,000 acres of easements in Madison County. Or you can stand at Big Sky, downtown in Big Sky, and look down Jack Creek. And from the bottom of Moonlight Basin all the way to Ennis Lake is under easement. But you look at the defining part of the West, and it's always been the open space. Those are my relatives that showed up here after the War of Northern Aggression, as they like to say, and came to Montana. And the ringling part of the family, they were sport lovers and dancers and speculators and circus owners. And you think about that late 1890s, early 1900s view that they had of the West. And then you kind of fast forward to, you know, 2017, what's the vision that happened? And I look at it and I look at our kids or hopefully our grandkids and that ground's always gonna be looked like that. Well, then you get all the attributes, you get the wildlife corridors, you know, you get 180,000 acres of timber, 1,700 miles of fishable water. Being a fisherman, it was kind of like, you know, I made it a lifetime uh, to try to fish all that water. Getting close.